to Dialogue Across Difference, an event series hosted by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Join us as Center Director Larry Jacobs and guests engage in conversations across the political and policy spectrum on issues of the day. Good afternoon, I'm Larry Jacobs. I'm a professor here at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs, which is the University of Minnesota's School of Public Affairs. Um, for those of you joining us online, I'd like to welcome you to participate. Uh, we take this very seriously, and you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. That's your entry into participating. Give us as many questions as you possibly can, and we're gonna get to as many as possible. If you're looking for live captioning, we also have that, and you can find that again at the bottom of your screen. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's program, Why Are We Trapped in Conflict and How Do We Get Out? Our guests today are Krista Tibbet and Amanda Ripley. Um, we're just thrilled to have both of them with us. Um, and this is the right time to have this conversation. Um, recent Washington Post headline, is the United States heading for a civil war? And if you stop and you think about it, the violence of our rhetoric in the public space is up. Extremism in some respects is flourishing. And violent attacks on members of Congress, other public officials, the family of public officials, such as Paul uh, Pelosi, um, members of Congress, uh, uh, judges, including Matt Kavanaugh, Supreme Court Justice, who found that uh, there was a plot against him, um, and election administration officials all over the country who are being tar targeted. What is going on here? Polls tell us that 40% of Americans believe that civil war is likely within the next decade. That's a poll with uh, the Economist and uh, U government that was conducted in August of this year. 25% of Republicans and 17% of Democrats say that threats against the other party's leaders are justified. Nearly two thirds of Americans think that the American democracy is more at risk now than last year. And this issue about kind of conflict and its threat to our civil and political worlds is quite broad. More than a fifth of millennials report that they ended a romance because of strife, particularly political strife. Pew Charitable Trust conducted a study of 17 advanced democracies. And they report that the United States stands out in terms of racial and ethnic strife, in terms of the tension between urban and rural areas. Why are Americans becoming enmeshed in conflicts that pit good and evil and that are enduring and seem to trap our communities and many of us? What, if anything, can be done? These are important questions that we're gonna be wrestling with today. There are polls and analysis uh, of data that we often use here at the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance in hosting programs. Um, usually do coast a couple dozen programs a year, and that is our typical um, approach. But we now know, um, from having done this for a while, that we need to be broader. We need collaborators. We need collaborators who are going to be able to understand and dissect and discuss the full range of human experience. And so we've engaged in collaborations with you know, social scientists, I confess someone, historians um, and others, but also storytellers and poets and photographers and painters because we recognize that this full range 
of human experience in America, particularly today, needs all, needs all those vantage points. And so we are delighted to be resuming our collaboration with Krista Tibbet, who is a Peabody award-winning broadcaster. She won the National Humanities Medal from President Barack Obama. She's a New York Times bestseller, and the list goes on. She is one of our leading voices in the public sphere. Her most recent book is Becoming Wise, an inquiry into the mystery and art of living. I turn to Krista Tibbet because I consider her a weather vane of the authentic <laughs> voices of moral and ethical and religious struggles and searches for community in a time when hope and, um, and strain are so prevalent. Christopher Lash, a historian of great note, tracked the dismemberment of our community by markets and globalization and travel. And he talked about searching for a ha haven in a heartless world. For me, the vital work of Krista Tibbet is continuing that search, and she invites all of us to join her. Please welcome Krista Tibbet. Thank you, Larry. Larry's always has been long been one of my favorite conversation partners. We have a conversation that's happening all the time. Um, also, it's amazing to be to be back here. We did a few events in the before times, and I actually haven't. Um, I was realizing I think this first uh, live interview I've done without people in masks, and I haven't done, didn't do much with people in masks. And I feel a little bit out of practice, so we'll see how this goes. Um, we are recording this for broadcast in the next season of On Being. We've moved to a seasonal rhythm, and that is going to be after the first of the year. Um, I, you know, in generally, even when we were a weekly show, I like to say that On Being is news relevant, but not not news hooked, not tied to the news cycle, but often following questions and dynamics that are still with us long after the news cycle has moved on. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about what happened this week, but that we, there will be a Q&A, uh, a time for you to have your questions, and, and that, that may be the time for uh, what feels really present and burning right now, today, this week. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I kind of wish that I was worried that this conversation would be outdated by January or February 2023, but I, I do not possess that fear. Um, so let me just introduce Amanda and then let's get into it. Well, I will, um, in about half an hour or so, I will uh, cue you for, to, to hand in the questions. People will come, if, you've, if you have a question, I believe you have something to write on, and those will be picked up. Then we'll open it up to a conversation in the room, and then I will bring it back to me and Amanda to close out the time. So, Amanda Ripley is an investigative journalist and author. She is also the co-founder of Good Conflict, <clears throat> a company that helps people, quote unquote, get smarter about how they fight. She writes for The Atlantic, Politico, The Washington Post, other places, and she also hosts a really interesting podcast with Slate called How To. So Amanda began her life as a journalist covering Capitol Hill for Congressional Quarterly. She wrote for Time Magazine for 10 years. She covered terrorism, crime, and disaster as one does. Um, and then in 2018, she wrote a really brilliant and incredibly important essay. And this is how I came to know Amanda, and it's called Complicating the Narrative. Um, she named and interrogated something that was unsettling and alarming to people inside journalism and outside journalism. Um, just we're gonna we're gonna explore this in depth, but but this this basic idea that journalism did not seem to be working the way it was supposed to, the way it once did, 
Um, and I think importantly, whether you're on the writing or the, on, the, on, the, on the making of journalism side or the receiving end of journalism, there is this chasm between um, the animating mission of journalism, the reason I think most journalists go into it, um, and the effect it was having on society, and the effect it's been having on a hyper-polarized society. So the subtitle of this article, uh, complicating the narrative, was what if journalists covered controversial issues differently based on how humans actually behave when they are polarized and suspicious? And this led her into a deep and illuminating interrogation about why we are so tied up in knots, which gets at the crisis in journalism, but the crisis that is present in all of our institutions and her examining what in part, how in part some of that is a symptom rather than the actual problem we need to be addressing. And in 2021, she again wrote something very important, um, this book, High Conflict, uh, why we get trapped and how we get out. This is an extraordinary resource for early 21st century humanity and it's being used that way all over the place, including in this city of Minneapolis. Um, I've seen you, Amanda, refer to yourself as a trained conflict mediator and also a recovering journalist. I think of you as a bridge person. Um, these days, she is as likely to be speaking to a newsroom or a civic event, um, working with really amazing arrays of identity and community groups, and also speaking to the Pentagon, the Senate, the State Department, the Department of Homeland Security, and a very intriguing select committee I'd never heard of <laughs> <laughs> called the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. Um, Amanda is both a chronicler and a participant in bringing the fuller story of our time and our life together into the light, which includes the longing so many of us carry and are living by to rise to the challenges of this century, to bring our higher muscular human capacities to that. and. She's really now at this stage in her career turned her powers of investigation um, to how this part of the story is happening all over the place. I see Kelly Chapman here, happening here. Um, and what we're learning that can continue to make that more possible um, in wider and wider circles. And I have been wanting to meet Amanda in the flesh for a long time, and I'm really grateful to Humphrey for <laughs> conspiring with me to get her here. Thank you so much, Krista. Yeah. I've been like having this conversation in my head with you for like five years, so <laughs> it's exciting that it's happening. I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you, Larry, and to everyone who made this possible. Thank you to all of you for coming out. Um, I'm excited. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go. So, you know, I always ask a question of um, origins. And that is a, I, I don't know that I knew this when I started doing that, but that's a, that's a, that's, that's a, a technique that's used um, often in conversations where we're trying to not have the predictable conversation. Um, hmm. And you wrote something that was, so, was just so helpful to me and why, why that works. I mean, I have all kinds of experiences of why it works, but you said something that was just really interesting, that stories of origins, when we, when we talk about our early life, our childhood, um, you said these are by definition dimensional and messy, unlike the debate we think we're going to have, um, because you said real life is not a bumper sticker. <laughs> so, um, I think the question I want to ask you about origins, come to focus in on the, our topic today, is um, how you would trace the roots of your awareness of your attention to conflict in the earliest background of your life, in your childhood. Your, your attention to conflict and what you took away from that about what to do with it. You know, I don't think I really uh, realized this until pretty recently, but if I look back, most of us, I think your first exposure to conflict is at home, right, with your family. If you think back, what's the first time you experienced 
conflict. Maybe it was with kids in the playground or on the street, but probably it's with a parent or watching parents have conflict. So in my case, um, my parents had a lot of conflict and it took different forms, but it usually involved a lot of yelling, particularly by my mother, but she, as my father was pick, quick to point out when I showed him a draft of the book, she was not entirely to blame. Uh, and they both, you know, uh, participated in this conflict in all kinds of ways. But as a kid, I would do this thing where I would monitor their conflict. I don't know if anyone else has this experience, but looking back on it, it's hard to understand. But it, as a kid, it made sense, like a lot of things we do as a kid, right? In, in some ways, it was helpful as a child, and then maybe less so as you get older. Mm -hmm. So I would monitor those fights from the top of the stairs, and I can vividly remember sort of drawing in the carpet, listening to them fighting. Uh, and I think it was a way to, to control it, right? Like a way to feel like I, I could, I, I was surveilling the conflict, if that makes sense. And um, by contrast, my brother, three years older and wiser in many ways, uh, would leave the house and go play in the woods or go yeah. play with his Star Wars action figures. And so he had other ways of coping, um, which also, you know, has pros and cons when you try to avoid conflict. So for me, I think that never ended in a way, mm -hmm. you know, like as a journalist, you're always monitoring conflict. Yeah, so I, I see, um, and you know, right, a lot of these patterns we learn don't serve us when we get, when we get older, but you, I think you wrote somewhere else, it was this, I, you know, I think when you're watching as a child, when you're surveilling, when you're listening, monitoring, as you said, you're, that's your way to try to feel safe, to try to keep yourself safe, to think that you can participate in ke keeping everybody else safe, and it, it feels to me like that, um, flows very naturally into the reason that you would become a journalist. Yeah, right. And I used to just feel like that was a failing, in other words, because it's a delusion. It's a sort of a grandiose one, right, that you can control conflict by writing about it or monitoring it. On the other hand, uh, it's better than a lot of other responses, right? Like, uh, and I think there is some helpfulness sometimes in trying to tell stories about the conflict mm -hmm. that are enlightening, if they are, or illuminating. But it's complicated. I, I thought about this a lot, you myself, because I also started out very early on as a reporter. And um, just, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but um, how do you, what do you think the, the mentality is, the sensibility of and I, I think we all know this isn't working the way it used to, but why that intense focus on corruption, dysfunction, danger? What was the mission orientation around that? Like what, what are you affecting by focusing on that? Well, you know the person who explained this to me the best was David Bornstein, who's a mutual friend of ours who yeah. runs the Solutions Journalism Network. And the way he put it is, journalists have a theory of change, and basically, that theory is, if I can shine a light on all the worst, most terrible things that are happening or might happen, then they will change or not happen, right? So there's a belief there that rarely gets articulated in newsrooms, in my mm -hmm. experience. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, it's just this assumption that it's carried an assumption. over. It's yeah. like, if I can just scream fire again and again and again, there won't be a fire or someone will come put out the fire. Yeah. And sometimes that works. Increasingly, it doesn't, and we can talk about that. But mm -hmm. that is the theory of change that I think we need to really start to hold up to the light mm -hmm. and say, this is true. And then also, I think there's a lot of ego involved, right? I mean, I think well, everybody yeah. wants every story to be Watergate every time. You know what I mean? Right, <laughs> so, and of course, good intentions get mixed just like bad intentions. <laughs> right, it's hard to separate, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've seen you writing, but tell me if this is right. Was it around 2016 that you really started to come to this conclusion that this is not working? Um, what do you remember? Like, was there a day or was there an event or a story that brought that home? What would have happened in 2016? I'm yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I mean, in terms of the journalism you were doing. Yeah, it just felt like, I mean, I had grown up where my dad was a Republican, my mom was a Democrat. 
Um, we got the Trenton Times and the New York Times delivered every day in New Jersey, and the New York Times was like revered in my household, rightly or wrongly. But, you know, my parents were the first in their families to go to college. Education was revered. I think there was a certain status attached to the New York Times, you know what I mean? Like, uh, so I picked up on that, and, and in my head it was revered, and it should be still in many ways. Um, but I think after the 2016 election, I couldn't, <laughs> I mean, how do you not ask yourself uh, if this is working out the way we'd planned, right? I mean, in other words, if it didn't seem to matter what the New York Times uh, reported mm -hmm. about Donald Trump mm -hmm. because half the country didn't believe they were acting in good faith. It doesn't, that it, it, it's not that it didn't matter at all, right? But it didn't, it didn't, um, if you'd revered the New York Times the way I was raised to do it, you just wouldn't have voted for Trump. You know what I mean? Like it just wouldn't have really added up, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me if you, do you disagree? No, I mean, I, but I think it's so much bigger than that, yeah. right? And, and I think it's easy to focus on an election. I mean, one thing I kind of just want to posit here yeah. in this room is that um, we were already in such knots pre-pandemic, right? Yeah. Um, and the pandemic and these these years that have followed have just ratcheted up every anxiety, but everything we're dealing with now and also everything we were dealing with in 2016 had been a long time coming. That's a good point, yeah. Um, so, but I mean, I just feel like you, um, yeah, so I, it, it, it's just interesting to me. I think you were feeling things that many people were feeling, but somehow you managed to put words around it, right? I mean, and you wrote, you know, you wrote, I think, in, um, in Complicating the Narrative, which was 2018. Um, there are all kinds of ways to analyze, right? And Larry has his way of analyzing, and I have my way of analyzing. We're coming up from two different directions. And you can talk about our national pathologies, you can talk about the influence of social media, you can talk about the business model of journalism. Um, and you said, all of this mattered. This is where you came to, but none of these explanations felt quite adequate. Something else was happening to something that had not been named. Was it in that time that you started getting conflict resolution training and yeah, so in my kind of midlife crisis of wondering what is journalism, does it matter, how can I be useful in this, in this world in which every story I do um, either will have very limited impact or just make things worse potentially, right? Um, part, part, partly I could go off on that midlife crisis because I was a freelancer, right? So I had some distance from these places at this point and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of privilege in that to kind of to sort of question fundamental things, which is much harder to do when you're in a newsroom every day yeah, having yeah. to go do yes. dangerous, difficult reporting. Right. Um, so I just want to name that. But also, um, so I kind of went off trying to figure out like what is going on here? How do I make sense of this? How do I be useful? And again, went down a lot of different avenues, which you've mentioned, um, all of which matter. But when I started spending time with people who study intractable conflict or who have been themselves in intractable conflict or malignant conflict as it's sometimes called, then it was like everything clicked. That, you know, part of how you have to understand, at least for me, what's happening is to understand what high conflict is, which is a special kind of conflict, mm -hmm. which doesn't behave according to the rules of normal or healthy conflict. And it's very magnetic. It's a kind of conflict that uh, becomes us versus them, where we feel increasingly morally superior and increasingly baffled and threatened by the other side or person. And we make a lot of mistakes. So there's a lot of research on this, and there is kind of a bright line between healthy conflict, good conflict, and high conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and just as a quick example, anger is okay in all the research on emotion and conflict. I'm a big fan of anger. Uh, I don't know if anyone else is a fan of anger, <laughs> but it is initiatory. It is um, important as a signal, right? It's energizing. 
contempt is really hard to work with, mm -hmm. and the same with disgust. So that's a bright line to just give you an example of what I'm talking about. But um, that for me was a really helpful uh, bigger umbrella to understand yeah. how all these other forces were interacting. And really what you did is you got interested in, of course I like this because the human condition is my lens, yeah. right? That's, I mean, there's this line where you said in, in complicating the narrative, after spending more than 50 hours in training for various forms of dis dispute resolution, I realized that I've overestimated my ability to quickly understand what drives people to do what they do. I have overvalued reasoning in myself and others and undervalued pride, fear, and the need to belong. And I want you to flesh this out. I've been operating like an economist, in other words, an economist from the 1960s. Yeah, you know, this is the thing that I think is really helpful for me in trying to understand where we need to get to. So if you think about economics used to be based on, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of reducing it down, so forgive me for the economists in the audience, but used to be based on certain theories about how people would behave, right? Um, and, and then finally Daniel Kahneman and others convinced the field, more or less, <laughs> that actually human behavior isn't quite as simple as you are assuming. Right, and the idea also was that there was, that we were basically rational, that, that, we were, that, we were, that people were basically rational economic actors, and of course that wouldn't be true all the time, but somehow this overall rationality would balance it out. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And it turns out that's not right. Yeah. And so yeah. you get this field of behavioral economics, and um, for a long time we were thinking of calling that essay complicating the narrative, because that's complicated too, the word complicated, not everybody likes that. <laughs> but we thought of calling it behavioral journalism, oh. but that felt too creepy and weird. Yeah. So, uh, but that would be the goal, is you know, yeah. what if you started over with journalism and you tried to create a field of storytelling that was designed based on what we actually know about what humans need to thrive and make decisions in a world that's inundated with, informa with information um, and that requires a lot of interdependence across different groups. So what would that actually look like? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, your show is closer to that, you know, mm -hmm. where you're mm -hmm. thinking about the audience as a human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So. So I want to come back to something that you, you just touched on. Um, well, I, let me just say this. So really this conversation we're having and the, the, the investigation you're doing, the conversations you're leading, the entry point was journalism, but this is really a conversation, exploration, and truth telling about what it means to be human and alive now. Um, so before we get into breaking down high conflict a little bit more, um, which feels so familiar even as you start to describe it. Um, I really do want to kind of establish this um, foundation that you're on that, and, and, and that, that psychology is on too, that conflict in and of itself is not problematic, right. that it's often productive, that it's necessary, that it is and can be a good. Yeah, this is like the single biggest mistake that I think it's made in public discourse around this. I mean, we need conflict to get better, to be challenged, to challenge each other. In fact, I think the U.S. needs a lot more good conflict, not less. Um, there's no better shortcut to transformation that I know of. And that's not what we've got. Right? So we've built a bunch of institutions to cultivate high conflict as opposed to good conflict which means we could design them differently, right, to cultivate good conflict. But mm -hmm. there's a place called the Difficult Conversations Lab mm -hmm. at Columbia University where Peter Coleman studies and his colleagues study conflict. And so they've hosted more than 500 strained and awkward arguments between people who disagree on profound, important things like gun control, abortion, the Middle East, and what they found is you can roughly sort those conversations into two buckets, which is there's one group um, that get really stuck in the same one or two negative emotions. And then there's another group where there's movement. So yes, they experience frustration and anger, uh, but then there's like a flash of curiosity or even humor, God forbid, 
and then uh, yeah. back to frustration and anger. So when you see it in the data, it's like a galaxy of emotions as opposed to just one. And, and that, I think, is how it feels to be in good conflict, right? There's a sense of movement. Yeah. Yeah, that something is possible here and you can't predict exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. And in those conversations, people asked each other more questions and they came out of the lab more satisfied than they'd come in. So I think I hold those graphs in my head as far as you know, what, what we've got and what, what we could have mm -hmm. and what I hope we have. Um, you, yeah, I wanna read two things that just put them side by side um, from High Conflict. You said, we need turbulent city council meetings, strained date night dinners, protests and strikes, clashes in boardrooms and guidance counselor office, offices. People who try to live without any conflict, who never argue or mourn, tend to implode sooner or later, as any psychologist will tell you. Living without conflict is like living without love, cold and eventually unbearable. And when you introduce the notion of high conflict, you describe it as the mysterious force <laughs> that incites people to lose their minds in ideological disputes, political feuds, or gang vendettas. The force that causes us to lie awake at night obsessed by a conflict with a coworker or a sibling or a politician we've never met. Right, so that's the diabolical thing about high conflict, right? Yeah. In every single one I've followed all over the world, you end up harming the things you care most about, the thing you went into the conflict usually to protect without realizing it, right? So there's something diabolical about that system of high conflict where usually everyone suffers, but to very different degrees, which is, maybe worth noting here that the phrase high conflict, which I liked better than intractable conflict. Which is, yeah, which is Peter Coleman's phrase is intractable conflict. Yeah, right. I, I just feel like intractable feels like impossible, uh -huh. even though I think that's not technically true. Yeah, high has a kind of alluring drama to it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and it doesn't, it could go, it could change, right? Yeah. Um, what goes up might come down. Yeah. Um, so, so the phrase high conflict comes from high conflict divorces, which mm. in the 80s, lawyers started noticing that about a quarter of American divorces were stuck in perpetual cycles of hostility and blame. And you know who suffered the most, yeah. which is kids, yeah. right? And that's true today in the United States, right? And that's true in, in every high conflict I've seen, whether it's gang violence or guerrilla warfare. That the children yeah. suffer. Yeah. yeah. So, there's a lot of similarity across really different conflicts, really different high conflicts, because humans are humans, mm -hmm. and there's collective behavior that's important, and there's different access to resources and weaponry, and that's important, um, but the behavior is really similar, which for me was exciting, because then it means you can learn. You can yeah. learn from high conflict divorces, and you can learn from high conflict politics, um, and it's sometimes helpful to get out of the myopic focus on one one kind of conflict and look at it sideways um, from another context. You know, something that this also sparks in me that I've, I've, I've thought about in these years is also how we have such a body of experience and intelligence in our personal lives about m navigating conflict, about how there's going to be lots of times when when how you then when when love is not a feeling but just things you do mm -hmm. despite how you feel that day mm -hmm. that that with the people we're intimate with we don't say every we don't blurt out everything we're thinking all the time yeah. because we know we're in relationship and there are times when what you do is you don't talk about certain things because you know it won't be heard or so you know one of the things y you talk about one thing high high comp conflict does is it collapses complexity and is thinking about how um, you know how annoying it is when <laughs> when you're getting relationship counseling and and they say you know you said you always yes and you're like well that, but it's true it's right. always true right but then <laughs> but 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 it's like all the things that we're doing in our life our public life yeah we we grapple with um, 
but talk about, it's very interesting how you write about it. And, and collapsed complexity is actually collapsing the fullness of reality. So what do we, what do we know about our brains on simplicity and our brains on complexity? Right, so one of the things that Peter Coleman and his colleagues tried, once they realized there were these two kinds of good conflicts and high conflicts in the lab, they decided, well, could we induce one or the other, right? So they experimented with different things. And one thing that they did was to show people a, a news story before they went into the lab um, about some other hot button controversy, right? And they gave half the group a traditional news story with, with basically two sides, right? Um, what you might see about most controversial issues, you know, where you have sort of activists or advocates arguing back and forth like a tennis match. And then they gave the other half uh, a story at the same length about the same controversy with more complexity tethered to reality. So it might say, you know, in fact, it's hard to sort Americans into two camps when it comes to abortion rights. In fact, most Americans have very complicated feelings about abortion. Yeah. Uh, and there might be four or six or eight different categories if you really try yeah. <laughs> to yeah. reduce it. And if you ask the question differently, people will answer polling on this subject very differently. So those people went in and had good conflict conversations. And the ones who read the traditional stories went in and were much more likely to have the less good <laughs> or high conflict conversations. So it's an example of how we can be primed for curiosity and complexity, mm -hmm. which is awesome, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think has obvious implications for journalism, particularly in a time like this, um, because I feel like my whole job now is to get people to be curious about things that they're not curious about, but maybe should yeah. be. And um, so, so I think, all of our normal cognitive biases get much more extreme in high conflict, and the research supports that. So you literally lose your peripheral vision, and figuratively, and you miss big opportunities that, I mean, everyone I followed for high conflict who was stuck in really, really difficult conflict and then shifted to good conflict, every single one of them made huge mistakes that they regret because the narrative was so powerful. So, you know, just as a quick example, Curtis Toller, who was a pretty high ranking gang leader in Chicago for many years, was really trapped in a series of vendettas uh, with a rival organization based on a story that he had had in his head since he was a kid about a homicide that was tragic and heartbreaking for him and many other Chicagoans. Eventually, he runs into the guy who had done that shooting and is at a point in his life where he can hear him. And he had that feeling, I don't know if anyone's ever had this feeling, where you're listening and suddenly something comes undone in your head and in your heart. And you realize that you've been really wrong about something you'd assumed about your enemy or the opponent. And it's a very destabilizing moment, very disorienting moment. Um, but it was really important to him to staying out of high conflict, to mm -hmm. be able to realize the mistakes that he had made, mm -hmm. all for understandable human reasons, mm -hmm. but you know, it just doesn't serve us well um, in the world we live in to stay too long in that world in which we are morally superior yeah. than other groups, yeah. Um. That's hard right now, I think, because in our fractured country, I think people feel very justified and like that it's very just very true that they are morally superior. That's yeah. our high conflict, right? Right. No, it's um, <sighs> just to circle back to Curtis, one of the things he told me is, I think whenever there's a better than and a less than, there's always room for war. So Curtis now works for Chicago Cred, which interrupts gang violence in Chicago and is doing really, really cool and difficult work um, trying to treat people who are most at risk of shooting or being shot as, as complicated humans, right? Um, and, and interrupt this cycle so they make mm -hmm. fewer mistakes um, just the way he wished he could have done sooner for himself, yeah. Um, you know, I have to say, I mean, just, polling 
you know, for example, like those, to, those, when those are, I mean, I know they're like, it's one of the things that happens in our society. I'm looking at Larry, the political scientist, where we, where data is, it's valuable, but also these things that come out as facts yeah. that help us simplify um, whole swaths of other human beings. Um, something I've heard you talk about too is that uh, we all have many identities, right? What is that line? Is, is it Emerson? We are, I contain multitudes. Yeah. And that's just true of all of us. Um, and you said something that can happen, and in the high conflict, I guess people are really locked into and defined by, and they're defining the other person by an identity. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about how it can happen that that another identity that somebody has, like you describe this moment, kind of breaks loose and enters the room. Right, that's a well put. I mean, I think with Curtis, it was his identity as a father. Um, it's often that, but not always. Like, but that is a very effective way to try to help people out of high conflict, is to light up their, their identities outside of the conflict, especially their identity as a parent or a child. Um, so, you know, if you think about it all the time, our identities are shuffling and reshuffling. Like if I leave the US, I become suddenly very American. I think I can generalize about 300 million people I've never met. Um, I get defensive when other people criticize America in the exact same ways that I'm happy to criticize America <laughs> about when I'm here. Yeah. Um, so you can feel that shift happen depending on your context but also depending on the threat and perceived threat. So one of the problems right now is that we are locked into this binary winner-take-all political system, right, where people don't have anywhere to go. So the more partisan leaders and influencers and pundits you can get to question, to sort of step out of the conflict, step out of the, the zombie dance of high conflict, then the more space you create for other people to still hold on to their identity as a Republican or a Democrat. And, you know, deeply refuse political violence as an option, right? So you have to create that space. Mm -hmm. And just very quickly, one of the things that, I love this because I think it's so hopeful. Um, Colombia, you know, has been through a lot of violence for half a century. And they've also tried a lot of things to invite people out of conflict, out literally out of the jungle, out of uh, the guerrilla groups to disarm and reintegrate. Lots of complexity there, um, you know, but putting all that aside, uh, one of the things that has worked best, according to pretty new research by Juan Pablo Aparicio, is they did these very simple public service ads during Colombian national soccer games, national team soccer games. And because they knew from listening to former guerrilla members that all of them listened to these games on the radio in the jungle, it, whenever they could. Hmm. And they, in those ads, would just say very simply, next, next time, come home, we're, see we're saving you a seat. Watch the next game with us. Uh -huh. And it was like the mothers and fathers of guerrilla members. And what they saw is the very next day, twice as many demobilizations, voluntary departures from the conflict, which um, over time, over nine years of running these ads, added up to more people leaving the Civil War voluntarily than left when the peace treaty was signed in 2017. So that's incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And there had to be other things happening, right? Like it wasn't yeah. just the ad, but. Yeah, no, but. Yeah, they lit up this other identity on purpose in a way that really resonated. Um, not just as child, but as Colombian soccer team fan, right? Which was still intact, mm -hmm. even as people were, you know. Right, and that's. A, that's revolting yeah. against the government. That was multiple identities. Yeah, yeah. You have said that there should be in journalism a fear and loneliness beat. Yeah. Yeah. Talk Wouldn't about that be that. interesting? What if somebody gave you that job? Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of what you're, 
what that's a little bit of an illustration of how that could be very sophisticated. Right. 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 It's not about feeling sorry for people. It's about acknowledging the reality. Right, because the, there's a few things that pretty reliably trigger high conflict, and one of them that I think is most underappreciated is humiliation. Uh -huh. So until we start talking about that mm -hmm. and reporting it and mm -hmm. understanding it, you know, we're really not telling the whole story. Yeah. So to me, that's... That's where I think journalism needs to go, right? Is there needs to be more psychologically informed reporting that we're not afraid to do. And I think mm -hmm. still it makes people nervous. It makes editors nervous. Um, you know, remember the whole debacle about whether you could say Trump was a narcissist. You know what I mean? Like this is not, this is not helpful <laughs> yeah. to get wrapped around the axle about that um, because we need a higher level of psychological literacy in the population, among voters, and among politicians, and among journalists. Yeah, and that uh, just saying, just making sure you attend to both sides or pay, pay lip service to both sides, you've said is just another form of simplicity. That's actually not complexity. Right, I mean, it, it's a trap in a way, mm -hmm. and you can spend a lot of time arguing about it. Like right now, there's a lot of people arguing about which side is worse when it comes to rhetoric. Yeah. And I'm happy to weigh in on that. And that's how this always goes. <laughs> in every high conflict, it's asymmetrical all over the world. And everybody rightfully focuses, understandably focuses on the same questions. Who is worse? Who is more to blame? And that is not how you step out of this dance. Mm -hmm. um, before we keep going, I, let's go ahead and collect the questions and we'll start We'll open it up in about 10, 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> I've, um, I mean, the other thing about the fear, what was it, fear and belonging, it's just to acknowledge that as a dynamic is to cover in journalistic language the full humanity of whoever's being covered and also the consumers of the of the journalism. I mean, I sometimes feel like like an, an, an one way, you know, we have this fascinating and terrifying uh, phenomenon right now that that this high conflict and polarization is happening everywhere globally, right? And I, I personally think that fear and there's a lot of good reason. People are being reasonable when they're fearful now, right? But um, I mean, there are a lot of things reasonably to be fearful about. Yes. It's what I mean. Um, that like another way to describe the, what's happening in the world is it's the amygdala on the loose. Yeah, you know, um, John Powell, who runs mm -hmm. the Othering and Belonging Institute, he explains it really well, I think. He said, you know, the pace of change, social, economic, technological, which way predates the 2016 election, to your yeah. point, right? Um, as well as, I would add, the, the pace of news, like the influx of information, has so outstripped our capacity to process it that it creates this profound anxiety and a sense of unease, right? And one thing we know about humans is that we're good at noticing when we're unhappy and we're afraid, especially, and we're really bad at assigning a reason why. So into that void. Or we, do we assign the wrong reason why? Yeah, or do we, okay. easily. We're very vulnerable to scapegoating when we're in okay. that period of malaise and, and fear and uncertainty. Uh -huh. So into that void, we'll step a long list of conflict entrepreneurs and politicians and pundits who are happy to give you a simple story about why you feel the way you do that blames somebody else, right? Um, so I think for me it's been helpful to think about um, that bigger picture of where did that malaise come from and sometimes it's, it's being tweaked and embellished and incited on purpose now, right? 
Um, yeah. I've been really yeah. struck just, you know, I came here from DC and I was in the hotel room last night watching uh, Friends, I think, which appears to be on the 24 hours um, on network TV. But anyway, it, the commercials were so fear-based because you all are in the middle of a election and I was like, whoa. Right. Um, I was struck the other day when Mandiant, which does a lot of the research on cyber security and hacking threats, released a report that um, the Chinese government seemed to be doing a lot of things that used to be really Russia's thing, where they would sort of induce fear and play on divides among Americans through fake news and social media. Mm -hmm. And I was struck thinking, reading it, I was thinking, I'm surprised they're even bothering. Like, we're doing this to ourselves. <laughs> right, like, right, literally, right. Do you, you don't need foreign yeah. agents to do this. Right. But I do Spend wish, the money elsewhere. Yeah, but I do wish we would run things through a filter. Like if I was if I was trying to tweet something, if a little pop up came up and it said, "Just so you know, this looks a lot like what a foreign agent would do if they were trying to turn Americans against each other. They've been doing that for like 150 years. Is this what you mean?" <laughs> mm -hmm. Because literally watching those commercials, you know, we we don't we're doing it to ourselves, you know. And then here's here's also the the terrible result of that, which you also are write about in such an such a compelling way. Fear doesn't in a in a when people feel vulnerable or humiliated or all the things one feels, it doesn't. Nobody says very rarely. I feel scared. Like, yeah. I'm afraid. Yeah. No, we get mad because that feels like a strong thing. And yeah. that gets rewarded. It gets rewarded on social media. And I really, you often, you know, you're doing such uh, complicated research. And then you also do, you're always applying this. And I think this is a lesson for all of us. Like, to, again, to what's happening close to home. Like, you notice. I saw somebody telling a story about your son. Like you notice, you understand in a way that I don't think I did with my children at home, that when they're afraid, afraid they don't, they, they'll, they, it, it shows up looking like anger, mm -hmm. being mad. Mm -hmm. At least with my son it does. I don't know if that's true for no, everyone. No, it, it makes so much sense. But it's interesting that this is something that we all do routinely and are so lacking in self-awareness about it. And now, I mean, it's such a crisis for our life together. Yeah, yeah, and I do this too, to be honest. Like, I, and that, maybe that's where he learned it. But I, when I'm frightened, I just, without thinking, I get angry, you yeah. know? Um, and I'm trying to undo that programming, but um, because it's super unhelpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it, it's an interesting thing, right? How yeah. our, all of our visceral assumptions about what will work when we feel threatened, when we want to persuade, all of those are wrong. And, and this is the lesson that I relearn every day in high conflict, any intuitive thing you do to get out of the conflict will almost certainly make things worse. So now I try, don't always succeed, to take my first intuition uh -huh. and just ask myself, just ask, could I do the opposite? What would that look like? Because that's how you step out of that dance. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's it's very unintuitive. Yeah. How so it much takes, of the time does that Right, work? it takes a lot of practice. It takes <laughs> yeah. a lot of practice in low stakes settings. But that's worth practicing. Totally, totally. So for me, you know, I talk in the book about looping as a listening technique, and there's other ones out there. Yeah, but, talk about looping. Okay, so looping is something I learned from Gary Friedman, who's a conflict expert who's in the book, who also gets sucked into high conflict uh, as soon as he runs for office in California. Um, but then extracts himself out of it to his credit. Anyway, he teaches this to mediators and I've now taught it to a lot of journalists because it's totally transformed how I interview people and how I talk to, you know, friends and family. But it's basically, you're listening for the most, the thing that seems most important to the other person who's talking. What's most important to them, not to me, <laughs> which was hard. Uh, for, I'm embarrassed to admit, it took me a while to make that switch. Um, and then I try to play it back to them, not robotically repeating the words, but distilling it into the most elegant language I can muster. And then, also easy to forget, then I check to see, is that right? 
Because when you do this, you ask them, you say, I that, literally ask them, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Cause they can tell, even if you're wrong, which is like way more than I'd like to admit, they can tell you're really trying. Uh -huh. So it's in sort of injecting a little humility yeah. because there's that old saying, the only mistake in communication is thinking it happened. You know, like we think we understand each other and we yeah. think we're saying th the thing. And actually it's much more iterative than that. Like it's mm -hmm. very hard to, you know, to get to the real thing on the first go round without some back and forth. This is also about how there's so much going on in a conversation that's happening that's not in the words. Yes. Right? And also that the, you can ask a curious sounding question. I mean, this happens in journalism all the time, but the other person at an animal level knows whether you're actually curious or not. <laughs> and they're going to respond to their animal level yeah. experience of you. Yeah, there was some really good research on this um, where they tried to see if people could tell if other people were listening um, based on the obvious cues. So I used to think it, it, it was listening if I was nodding and smiling at the right moments and came prepared with my questions and furrowed my brow and all those things. It turns out that's not listening. People can tell when you're really listening and it's usually not always based on what you say next. No. <laughs> yeah. like, what, are you actually hearing what I'm saying? I mean, you've been interviewed by reporters. Like, yeah. you know this feeling of yeah. you say something that feels really revealing and to you important and you actually want to say more about it yeah. and they immediately go to something else, yeah. you know, and you're just like, oh. Yeah, it's about them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, kind of following on this wonderful place we got, which is things we can do, <laughs> things we can practice. Um, I, I kept a couple of pages of notes of places in your writing where you share um, it, it, the power of a better question. And um, I mean, that's the other thing. A question, a question is such a powerful thing, right? And so um, if a question, the way I think about it is a, that answers rise or fall to the questions they meet, right? So if a question is combative, it's just very hard not to be combative back. And if it's simplistic, <laughs> it's really, like as you say, even if you really have something you want to say, somebody asks you a simplistic question, it's really hard to transcend that and say something complex. Yeah. Um, and it, I've noticed all these places. I'm just going to share some of these, but I want you to jump in. Like, you know, and, and you've talked about specific questions that have been found to be useful in different settings. So here's a setting where you're working with another recovering journalist. Um, and this were, these are suggestions for reporters. What is oversimplified about this issue? How has this conflict affected your life? What do you think the, think the other side wants? What's the question nobody is asking? What do you and your supporters need to learn about the other side in order to understand them better? Um, here's another one, uh, working with a newsroom. Um, what, here's an, what do you want the other community to know about you? What do you want to know about the other community? Um, a couple that in my life, like one that was really important to me early on was with an evangelical um, philosopher Richard Mao who said he was talking actually about the issue of gay marriage which we we don't even discuss it that way anymore which is interesting to remember um, and he said I just wish we could stop the 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 suspicion and we could just start the conversations about saying what are the hopes and fears you bring to this hmm. I could just lay out the hopes and fears rather than the arguments um, and Francis Kissling, who I actually talked to in this space, and we had a conversation about abortion and vowed with two people on the two sides and vowed not to use the words pro-life or pro-choice, which you can actually do. And she talked about this question she's used, um, asking, um, she said, and this is something you have to get to because it's a vulnerable question, but mm. if, if people can get to a place to say, what in my own position or group ca creates, causes me discomfort? Mm -hmm. And what do I admire in the position of the other? 
I'm so glad you shared these because I was dying to ask you what questions you like to ask to get to this because I'm constantly adding to that list. So yeah, this is great. Um, one of the questions that we got from Jay Rosen was along those lines. And he's a he's a kind of journalistic yeah. sage. <laughs> yeah, like a yeah thinker. Um, yeah. And he his question was, where do you feel torn? Right along those lines. Yeah. And then my the other one I'm really into right now, which comes from um, actually family therapy, which is if you woke up tomorrow and this problem was solved the way you want it to be solved, how would you know? Like walk me through that day. Because people very rarely get to talk about or even think about what a better future would be like. Mm -hmm. And it's just a way to get out of our old grooves on this, on whatever the subject is and try to be filled with wonder and curiosity again, mm -hmm. you know? Mm. And you've talked about how you've experienced people who get to that other side and how life-giving that is. Yeah, I think this is the thing that's hardest to talk about um, because people don't believe you typically, but... <laughs> Um, when you actually are in the presence of good conflict with people you really profoundly disagree with, mm. when there are the, enough guardrails and connective tissue, there's something euphoric about it. Um, you want more of it. So I actually ended the book with a woman named Martha Acklesberg who uh, is, lives in New York City and went on this very unusual like three-day homestay exchange to visit conservatives in Michigan. Um, and she said to me, you know, I wanna be the way I showed up there all the time in my life. Open, curious, able to be surprised. Mm. And this is someone who's very partisan and she was visiting someone who was very partisan on the other side. So it was, it was not an easy experience. And, and I think somehow it's easy to, to sort of gloss over that. It was upsetting at times, frightening at times, angering at times, and also exquisite and something that very few of us get to do anymore. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that, it's just a, it's a manifestation of what you said, the, the qualities of good conflict, that it is movement, right? It's growth. Right, and you feel it in yourself. Uh -huh. Yeah. So let's um, invite Larry up to do some, have some conversation in the room. Conversation in the room and with nearly 300 people who are watching. And, and beyond the room. And beyond the room. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first question, is the current moment new or repeat of the past with social media serving as a megaphone this time? Well, I think there's a lot of similarities in the current moment to other high conflicts all over the world and throughout history. I do think that what's new is we've really reached the upper limits of the ability to solve these problems with us versus them adversarial thinking. You know, we just can't solve big problems that way anymore because we're too interdependent and too aware of each other and too globalized. So we can't keep using the same old us versus them model to try to solve problems. And that's particularly obvious in politics, right? And one of the reasons the US is so much more polarized than other countries is that we have a binary winner take all system with just two choices. So if you win, I lose. And, and most democracies have proportional representation where it's not winner take all. Um, and there's, you know, ranked choice voting, which more states are experiencing, experimenting with, is an example of something that would be better, right? Mm -hmm. Where you get to choose your top four candidates or five candidates as opposed to one. So I think we've, a lot of this is the same. And yes, social media matters, although maybe a little less than we've assumed. Um, I think human behavior matters a lot. And uh, if, you, if you look at, 
just the way the world has changed and the flow of information has changed. Trying to solve this high conflict with more high conflict is gonna make things worse. So Amanda, this questioner went on and asked about the Civil War, excuse me, the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement when you had us and them thinking, you had intractable conflict, and you had massive bloodletting in some cases. Is that different? Is, is that qualitatively um, you know, a distinct type of high conflict? Or are we searching for kind of Yeah, I mean, anytime, anytime you've divided, sorry, anytime you've divided the world into us versus them, particularly when there's a moral hierarchy of superior and inferior, then you're very susceptible to high conflict, right? There's, there's these three kind of preconditions that usually are present. In addition to humiliation, there's corruption. So when institutions are corrupt or perceived to be, you're at high risk for high conflict, right? Because people can't trust the institutions to tell them what's happening in the world or to seek justice and redress, so they'll seek it themselves, right? Um, and humiliation, which we've mentioned, also the presence of conflict entrepreneurs. So right now we've, we've got a bunch of um, platforms that really celebrate and reward conflict entrepreneurs. So these are people who inflame conflict for their own ends. Usually people who, who have themselves been damaged through life and haven't been willing or able to deal with that. So they're kind of spreading it around, you know? So the presence of comp, these are all things that have existed throughout time, right? The humiliation, corruption, the presence of conflict entrepreneurs, and also binary identities, like us versus them groups that are very rigid. Um, all those things are unfortunately, you know, I think pretty universal. Um, what's different now is that, you know, we can, we can share information about that really quickly. So uh, yeah. there might have been an, a, a them that I just wouldn't have been aware of 50 years ago in, in a way that I am now. Mm -hmm. That's maybe an unsatisfying answer. Do you have any thoughts? No, that, I mean, it's an unsatisfying situation we're in. Yeah, I mean, the other difference between now and the Civil War is we're not at war yet. So you, it's a little late in the game when, you know, when you're at war. Um, probably a civil war wouldn't look like that in the U.S., but you would see sort of an escalation of political violence, which we are seeing. So when I talk to people, and I did a lot of that recently, just talking to people who study political violence and have tried to interrupt it in other countries, usually on behalf of the U.S. government, uh, and are now working in the U.S., their whole thing is, can we skip the war and do all the things that we now ask other countries to do after war? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's an open question, mm -hmm. but there's a bunch of stuff that, you know, we have not even begun to do the things you would do if you wanted to interrupt this conflict. I mean, something that I do worry about is that, again, a, a, an, a poll that tells us how many people think we're headed right. towards civil war becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It shapes our imagination. Imagination shapes action as much as America. Right, wouldn't it be better to just ask people, are you afraid? Yes. To your point earlier. Yeah. Are you afraid for the future? Mm -hmm. Because that's really what that question is. Yes. You know, I mean, I don't know what else it is. And so then continuing to ask it and then publish about it right. just continues to make more people frightened. Yeah. Um, but it's not, it's, it's a good measure of fear. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There's actually a lot of research on question wording that would reinforce what you're saying. Mm. Next question. Um, how do Jewish, trans uh, people, um, black, indigenous, and people of color work to reconcile with those who do not see them as human and see them as some part of an evil conspiracy to indoctrinate kids or take over the world? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some situations and some people that you're, you're not going to reach, right? And there's Often in high conflict, that group feels much bigger than it is until things get worse, right? So there's a, there's a very difficult line there of you know, who, who is still willing to engage in good faith, who is open to questioning their assumptions, 
can I question my assumptions about them? You know, um, I think power matters and not everything is complicated. And people are complicated. So, you know, it's funny because when I'm not sure of this myself and I struggle with it internally, I often find it really clarifying to reach out to people who have been in much worse conflict. <laughs> um, because the things, for example, Curtis Toller asks young men to do in Chicago right now are much, much harder than anything we have asked of members of Congress. And yet they have far more trauma and far fewer resources. So it can feel, and it's a little bit of a trick of the mind, it can feel like millions of people are beyond talking to. But in fact, if you talk to someone like Curtis or people who work in civil war in other countries or even genocide, you cannot give up on anyone. It may not be that you personally have to engage, right? That's okay. But someone sure does. And it's a little bit of a bummer because <laughs> I feel like I'd like to give up on some people and I'm sure people would like to give up on me and that's not the way this is gonna go down. Mm -hmm. We are stuck with each other in this country. One of the things that I was talking to someone who worked on um, peace in South Africa, one of the things that has to happen is we have to convince each group that the other group is not leaving. They're not gonna be annihilated. They're not gonna die out. We are stuck with each other and we've got kids together, just like in a high conflict divorce. So it's, really hard to come up with an example of someone you would give up on completely. John Lewis said that. Okay, I feel never better Never give up on anyone. <laughs> what? I feel better yeah. knowing that um, he agrees. But, but you're right, it's not necessarily that you have to, that everybody needs to be with them. I, um, you know, one thing John Powell says also is, um, he says, um, we're in relationship, right? Like you can look at those fractured maps, red states, blue states. He said, we, you can be in a good relationship, it can be a bad relationship. You're right, we're in like a high con conflict divorce situation, but we're in relationship. Yeah, and we've got kids together. And, and we've got we can kids get divorced, together. but you're still gonna have to deal right. with the custody arrangement. I mean, yeah. that's just the way it is. William Urey, who works on peace negotiations all over the world, he says, there's no winning this marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's a good way, a good thing to keep in mind. And, um, and I think one thing that people get paralyzed about understandably and start to feel hopeless, like there's nothing they can do, there's no group they could convene, there's no relationship they could build close to home that would matter because they'll look at the worst case, most violent. Mm. I really am great, this language of conflict entrepreneur is helpful. Um, I couldn't, I can't change that person's mind. Right. But I think I've heard you say, you don't have to start with the worst case exemplar. Right. Who you can get in the room or, or, or build an actual relationship with matters. Right, because your mind will naturally go to the extremists, the worst case, the, uh, the deviant outliers, like the, you know, and that's understandable because they are threatening. Um, and I'm always trying to remind myself to widen the lens, right? To look at a fuller picture. So when, you know, Curtis came out to talk to some Senate chiefs of staff about how he helps interrupt violence in Chicago and how we might try to do that on Capitol Hill. And their reaction, understandably, was, you know, you're talking to the wrong chiefs. Like, we're not the problem. And you hear this again and again. I hear this with members of Congress. I mean, it's amazing. And you hear it with gang members, you know? Like, it's not us. It's, the, it's those guys. And they're not wrong often and so but the nice thing is to be able to turn to curtis and say what do you think since since we don't have the right people in the room is all hope lost and then he says well amanda we never have the right people in the room at first that's you just that's not how these things start you know you start with who will come into the room and then you slowly expand the circle and you're not going to get every single person 
Another question, uh, this one's from online. How do we have civil conversations when we cannot agree what the facts are and what is real? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is where my head often gets stuck, right? You know, you go round and round. Well, what if this happened and then this happened? Well, but we can't do anything because, or let me phrase this another way. I am afraid because we cannot agree on basic facts, to go back to your point. Let's say the thing, right? So if we can't even do that, isn't all hope lost? Um, often I will try to ask that question, how do you decide whom to trust when I'm interviewing someone who breaks out some like, you know, information that I, I know to be false? It's like, how do you, because I've heard this other thing, so how do you know? Mm. And that gets actually into some interesting spaces. So that's the question you'll ask when somebody's giving you a fact that you out. Right. Rather, th I used to get into a, you know, I'll be like, well, actually, statistically, fact. let me just give you this controlled study that, you know, and that's yeah. <laughs> just not the way people work. I wish it were, you know. And yeah. so, so first I try to acknowledge what they've said. I'm like, oh, wow. So you feel like X, Y, Z. Huh. So now they know I heard them, right? Because that's half of what people want is to be heard. Happens about 5% of the time, according to the research. So at least I could give them that. And then, it's funny because I heard the exact opposite. How do you decide who to trust today? Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. that doesn't fix it. Like we still mm -hmm. got a big problem. Mm -hmm. But why we're not talking about trust and how to build it every single hour of every single day in this country, I do not know. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know how we get out of this without working mm -hmm. on that. Because Which again is, is the question we'd be asking if it were in a real world relationship. <laughs> Right, right, if it was a couple in the That's room. That's what we'd be focusing on. Right. And we focus on that all the time in our lives. Right, right. It's not a new problem. Yeah. Um, but it is a harder problem and a more amorphous, yeah. right? I mean, it is. But I once interviewed a trust researcher, and he said to me, I don't know why I found this reassuring, but maybe you all will too. He said, uh, you know it's impossible to survive without trust. So everybody trusts something or someone. So then it's about, well, why? Why that thing and not the other thing? Mm -hmm. And you know, how does that shift? Because there are countries that have dramatically, including Germany, dramatically increased trust in recent history mm -hmm. in public institutions. So why aren't we studying how they did that? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and there are, I mean, to be fair, there are people focused on this, like the Trusting News Project is a great example. Um, but I feel like more creative, talented, dedicated people need to be focused on this. Another question from our online audience. Google and Facebook prioritize keeping you on the site. Activating high conflict related emotions is a good business strategy for them. Do you have thoughts about remedies such as regulations on how they operate? Yeah, so I think that um, any Okay, I have sort of a, a like a controversial view on this, and so hopefully you'll disagree, and then we can get a fuller picture. <laughs> um, I think that is all true, and there is a problem because there's so much money to be made by ginning up contempt and outrage. That is a real problem, and <laughs> I think there's huge unmet demand in the American public for something else. So again and again, I've seen examples of news stories that do conflict differently and are longer, let's say TV, local TV news story, longer than the typical TV news story, and people love it if it's done well. Hmm. But it has to be done well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, when complexity, when, when simplicity is cliche, complexity is breaking news. And you can really bring people out with complexity, with humanity. Look at, right now, streaming TV series are more complicated depictions of humanity than the news. That's amazing, right? But it shows that there's huge demand for something else in the public. And, and you have to regulate, and you have to um, change the rules about what's possible, and, I mean, 
I don't know about you, but it infuriates me, the Section 230 that, that I'm not held, you know, that, that Twitter and Facebook are not ha held to the same standards the media outlets I work for are held mm -hmm. to. I mean, mm -hmm. there were many times when I worked at Time Magazine where we had a really, what we thought was a good story, but it had some holes, and we didn't run it. And that was because we didn't want to be sued and lose. Make no mistake, not because we were nice, not because we were professional. So if you don't have any pressure, any threat of litigation, which is the case for these places because of Section 230, you're not going to follow those same, you're, there's no guardrails, right? And I, it just doesn't make sense to me that that hasn't been fixed. Um, Larry, I'm going to pick it up from here, okay? Because we've got 10 more minutes. Yeah, I... Um, I also think that it, I, I love hearing you talk about stories that do something different that work. Um, because the truth is, for all the reasons we've been talking about, the complexity of human beings and our psychology and how, what a powerful motivator fear is, and, and, and our bodies are, it was designed to protect us, right? Yeah. It's, it's not the enemy, but we gotta, we've gotta grow up. Yeah. And, um, so there's a reason that the, that the terrible inflammatory story, the conflict entrepreneur, even the story about the most catastrophic, terrible, heartbreaking thing that happened today, mm -hmm. um, it mobilizes us. Mm -hmm. And it is a challenge for, the, for journalism to know how to make goodness as riveting as yeah. evil. Yeah, right. But you know it's possible. I think that's what I have been trying to exactly. Yeah. That's what you've been doing. Yeah. Well, that that's what's been probably one of my one of my questions. And, uh -huh. I, and you're yeah, but yeah, you're, but it is. You're right. I mean, there's there's some wiring here that is hard to resist. Yeah. And there's a lot of wiring that we've managed to get better at. I mean, you know, oh gosh, the other day I was talking to a editor at a national news outlet that I won't name and that uh, and he said you know the problem is we've just gotten too good like we know people too well so we know how to push out headlines they will click on yeah like he he literally felt like we were he literally said we are too good at knowing what's in people's hearts and minds and I I, I wish I had said I didn't think of I always think of it like you know an hour later I was like uh, I was just flummoxed at the time because I'm not on staff at a place and so I'm not like in this all the time. And I was like, wow. Uh, but what I should have said is, well, you know what really gets a lot of clicks is porn. So why doesn't your prestigious news outlet just do that? If you know people so well, what's the difference? You know, I mean, so this idea that this is different mm -hmm. and acceptable mm -hmm. um, needs to shift. Mm -hmm. And I think more and more journalists are getting really just exhausted from this. Yeah. Um, just like readers, you know. Yes, audience. no, they're, yeah, and it's, it's a, they share, we all share this problem, this yeah. challenge. So knowing what you know about um, good conflict, um, you know, I think the simple word that gets thrown out is what we want is unity. And I'm not sure I believe in that. I'm not sure unity will be interesting. <laughs> Certainly doesn't have drama. <laughs> um, what is, like, what is the vision of what, what becomes possible? How, how we are living together and interacting if we get better at conflict? Yeah, so we definitely, I don't think we want unity. And I don't think we want bipartisan harmony. And I don't think we even want compromise. Although that's bound to happen if you start treating each other as humans. Um, but that's not a word that Gary Friedman uses, compromise, when he mediates really hard conflicts um, all over the world. Because you're tr what you're trying to get to is something that expands the definition of us, right? Where, you know, it, it's just, not one person sacrificing or surrendering and the other person winning. Um, so I, I think there's a whole other range of possibility that we have only just begun to visualize for what 
good conflict mm -hmm. and uh, a more evolved way of dealing with conflict looks like. A couple quick examples. The Baha'i faith, which I didn't know much about until I started working on this book, is one that has at its center the idea that we are all connected, whether we like it or not. So then what? And one of the things they do to try to keep the ego in check and reduce these sort of false binaries in conflict is, you know, because they're all run sort of at the local level by, you know, people in the faith who get elected. Um, and one of the things they do is there's no campaigning, there's no nominating yourself, there's no, and then, you know, it's considered service. You have to serve if you get elected. And when you introduce an idea in, in, in a debate, it's no longer yours, you know, it becomes the collective's. Mm -hmm. So they have a bunch of little things they do just as a matter of course, as sort of habits to keep the ego in check so that they can disagree and they can have the most you know, different ideas come to the surface. And there's like a baseline level of dignity with which they're treating each other mm -hmm. so that that doesn't get severed. Um, other quick example is um, there's a group in that's test piloting um, something called a dignity index in Utah in the elections, the midterm elections right now, um, where they're working really hard to figure out how to evaluate politicians' speech based on how much dignity you're showing to the other person, even as you profoundly disagree, right? So there is a way to have a radical vision of change and still treat people with dignity. That is a thing. And the more we can surface examples of that, mm -hmm. like who is that in Congress who has a radical vision of change because that's what Americans want. Mm -hmm. And refuses to succumb to dehumanizing language. Mm -hmm. You know, that's someone I wanna vote for, right? And just in terms of kind of bringing this down to this question that we all wanna ask, like what can I do? How can I make a difference? This person, Dan Christensen, would you just tell the story of Dan Christensen? Yeah, so the best thing that's ever happened to me on Twitter is I met bus driver Dan, who uh, is a public bus driver in Portland, Oregon, who's also very fascinated by conflict and communication and has read a lot of books on it and tried out a lot of things on his bus because you know, who's taken a bus recently, a city? Okay, so you know there's a good amount of conflict that happens on public buses. So he has this lab, and as he puts it, you know, I just assume every day that I'm the only one who's unarmed and I'm strapped in. So he has to inter interrupt conflict, um, and he has a bunch of techniques that he uses, and we had him on the How To podcast for how to deal with a fight in public, you know, when you're not the one directly in conflict and he does a bunch of things that um that i've learned from and one of them is as soon as someone comes on the bus he welcomes them with like a, a genuine smile mm. hi how are you even when they don't respond that's so that's brilliant right that's create that's hospitality yeah and that's a tool a technology that humans use to elevate yeah how yeah. people walk into the room right because he feels like something might go down yeah but somewhere in your subconscious, you might think of me as a friendly. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I, I've greeted you as a person. Mm -hmm. I've seen you. And he said he, when he was wearing masks during the pandemic, peop, he could tell that people could tell if he was smiling or not, yeah. even under the mask. Because mm -hmm. you know how your voice changes when you smile, you know? Um, so he would always smile with mm -hmm. or without a mask. And then when conflict erupted, he has a methodology, which I love, which is basically two questions and a choice. So, you know, first he pulls the bus over and opens all the doors mm -hmm. because it's important not to corner people who are in conflict, metaphorically or literally. Let me just say that again. It is important not to corner people who are in conflict. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something to keep in mind. Um, they have to have a way out. And so then he gets on the intercom, which is helpful. I wish I had an intercom. <laughs> and he says, what happened? Right, he doesn't say, I mean, there's a million things he could say, like, what are you doing? What is your problem, you know? And he says, what happened? In a voice of genuinely wanting to know. <laughs> so this takes practice. Yeah. And then, you know, what usually happens is because people, when they're in that 
amygdala hijacked mode, mm -hmm. they don't really see a question coming. So it forces them to think for to a second. Think. Yeah. yeah. And so they'll say, well, he closed the window and I, da, da. and Dan will say, I can tell you're really mad. So he's looping them quickly. And then he says, what do you want to do next? So it's not him telling them. And then he gives them a choice, which because usually that flummoxes them. Like, well, blah, blah. and then he says, that's my angry conflict voice. Uh, and then he says, um, I could, you could come up, okay, he says, I could call someone right now, which I'm gonna have to do, or you could come up here and talk with me and we get everyone safely to where they're going. So he's offering them a way out, mm -hmm. come with me. Uh, there's, there's a lot more to it, but he's, he's just a very wise, experienced practitioner. It's, it's, it's <laughs> such an important story. Um, we have to bring this to a close. We could obviously keep talking forever. I, um, I have to say, I was really intrigued that you quote Rumi, <laughs> the poet, uh, is Muslim mystic, at the beginning, at the very beginning and the very end yeah. of High Conflict. Isn't that the great thing about writing a book? You just do whatever the <laughs> heck you want. Yeah, but it ends like when the soul lies down in the grass, the world is too full to talk about. So this is actually also spiritual work we're talking about, isn't it? Absolutely. I think that's what's missing from a lot of these conversations is, is joy, wonder, hope, dignity, and faith. So thank you for bringing those things mm -hmm. into my ears, especially during the pandemic. You really mm -hmm. helped keep me sane, um, and I think many other people. I vividly remember going on those endless walks. I just kept walking the same routes. Yeah. And you know how people would cross the street when they saw you coming, which I get, but it's not a great feeling, just <laughs> intrinsically. And I remember listening to you talk about how you too had cut down on your news consumption. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, oh, it's okay. Like you gave me permission to do that. And also to question, you know, is there a better way to do the news? You know, maybe it's not just that I've gone soft. You know, if Krista's doing it. <laughs> right. So thank you for that. Well, if I was a source of nourishment to you, then I, I'm, I'm very pleased because we need you. Um, and thank you for what you're doing and for this beautiful investigation you're on on behalf of the rest of us and for being here today. Thank you. Yeah. I've still got my radio okay, skill. Just a quick right closing I know. comments. Sorry. Uh, First, I want to um, thank these two terrific people who joined us, Amanda Ripley and um, the terrific um, Krista Tibbet. Thank you so much. I want to let everybody know if you're interested, there'll be a podcast and a um, YouTube of this. It'll be up in one or two days, and you can just search for it either by coming to, uh, to us, and we'll send out an email, or by looking for Dialogue Across Difference. Uh, I want to let you know that all these programs we do are free and open to the public. That's what we're about. If you'd like to support us, that'd be great. Uh, Give to the Max Day is coming up in about two weeks, and we'll be uh, focusing on our Policy Fellows Program, which is an extraordinary program that brings together uh, young thought leaders, business community, nonprofit, and government who are concerned about community. Um, and it's really a tremendous um, you know, way of kind of building our civic culture. And I think is very much in the spirit of what Amanda Ripley was talking about today. Once again, thank you very much. <laughs>